Today on Know the Truth from Philip DeCourcy. Be encouraged. One, because God will never leave you or forsake you. Be encouraged because whatever's going on in your life, all things are working together for good. Be encouraged because whatever you're facing, God loves you, always has, and always will. And be encouraged because Psalm 2 is going to remind you as you look out on our nation and across the nations, God rules the nations. They say hindsight is twenty twenty. In retrospect, we can often see how God was working through the hard times. But wouldn't it be nice if we could have that perspective on the front end of the trial? Well, we may not know how a specific situation will turn out, but thanks to Scripture, we can always know where history is headed. And that's our subject today on Know the Truth. So here's Philip DeCourcy with his message and continuing his new series called Be Encouraged. What once belonged to the back alleys is now strutting down Main Street. This is a day when men call evil good and call good evil. And then so in this matter and regarding these things, I can think of no better text to turn you to than Psalm 2. As we're looking at this subject of encouragement, we can be encouraged because God will never leave us or forsake us, because all things are working together for good, because we're loved forever in Jesus Christ. And because, as Psalm 2 teaches us, God rules the nations. And in the end, He wins. In the end, He will show Himself as Lord. In the end, He will preside as King. Psalm 2 is showing us that the last laugh belongs to God. He will judge the nations. He will quell their rebellion as they have stood up against His sovereignty and His Son. So here's a great encouragement for the belittled and bloodied people of God. As I've said, in the end, God wins. In the end, Jesus reigns. Isn't that where the Bible finishes in Revelation 20? Jesus reigning on planet earth. All the kingdoms of this world becoming the kingdom of our God and Savior. Righteousness reigns. In the end, God wins. In the end, Jesus reigns. And that means in the end, we win And in the end, we reign because Romans 8, 17 tells us we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. As we look at Psalm 2, let me at least begin by tying it into Psalm 1. Both of these Psalms are strategically placed and purposefully chosen to begin the book of Psalms. They kind of summarize a lot of the themes that you'll find in the rest of the material. They act like two pillars at the entrance of the Psalter. And Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 answer two great questions. Psalm 1 answers this question, where am I going? Psalm 2 asks an even bigger question, where is history headed? Psalm 2 is really Psalm 1 gone international. Psalm 1 addresses the individual. Where are you going? What road are you on? What choice have you made? Psalm 2 addresses the nations, the world. It's universal in its scope. And it brings us to that final moment when history ends at the feet of Jesus Christ. I think it's a Christological, messianic, prophetic psalm that points us to the end of the book of Revelation when Jesus will come and He will speak and the nations will fall in adoration at His feet. Here's an interesting thing as you look at Psalm 2. If you listen carefully enough, there's four people speaking, four voices to be heard. In verses 1 to 3, you have the voice of the nations who are raging against God. In verses 4 to 6, you have the voice of the Father who laughs in contempt. In verses 7 to 9, you have the voice of the Son who talks about His conquest of the earth. And finally, in verses 10 to 12, you have the voice of the Holy Spirit calling the nations to kiss the sun lest they be angry. It's a gospel invitation. The voice of the nations is a voice of conspiracy. 
Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. Notice this, against the Lord and against his anointed. They say, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. The psalmist describes the world as a troubled sea rising in a tidal wave of opposition toward God. If the world loves Jesus at all, and if you look around, you might see a little bit of that. If the world loves Jesus, I can tell you this. They love the Jesus they have created, not the Jesus revealed in the word of God as God in human flesh, sinless and the only way to heaven. The nations rage and people plot and take counsel to gather. Some very unlikely alliances take place because they're united in their hatred against God and His Son. And the futility of it? Why did they do this? <laughs> That's kind of where we begin. Why do the nations rage? And, and the intent of that is, how stupid are they? I mean, really, That's the point. Why do they do this? Have they not seen the movie before? Do they not know the outcome of nations rising up against God? Look at it. As you and I look out on our culture and where things are going, how often does that word come to us? This is crazy. We've got the voice of conspiracy, the nations. Then we've got the voice of contempt, the Father. Here we have the seething of the nations rising up in opposition against God. And then all of a sudden, we kind of take a deep breath and the psalmist says, now you need to know God's not panicked and God's not perturbed. All their huffing and all their puffing won't blow down the kingdom of God. The nations cannot upset God's king. They cannot thwart God's plans or topple God's throne. Because you see, the king has been established. Verse 6, Yet I have set my king on my holy hill, Zion. That's another word for Jerusalem. That's where Zion is. So the point is this. God laughs as the world rages, as the centuries pile upon the centuries and the world unfolds in rebellion against God. God's got a plan and then he sniggers at all their silly, puny attacks because he has set a king on a throne and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And someday Jesus will come and take his throne and you and I will sit with him on his father's throne, right? Revelation 3, 21. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. Jesus controls the destiny of all living creatures. That's why you must decide for him. There's triumph with him. There's defeat without him. Let's move on to the voice of conquest the voice of conquest, the voice of conspiracy, the nations, the voice of contempt, the father, the voice of conquest, the son. This is verse 7 through 9. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like potter's vessels. The Father has decreed that His Son will someday inherit the nations. That history will climax at the feet of Jesus. And we're being told here that's exactly what will happen. Jesus will accomplish within time what the Father has decreed. And we can tell again from the language, this is a physical, national, historical kingdom at the end of history. The person being talked about here is a Davidic descendant. The place we're talking about here is the city of Jerusalem. The end we're talking about here is the judgment of the nation. This is not the church age. This is at the end of the age. This is not even fully fulfilled when Jesus was raised from the dead and sat at the right hand of God. This is Revelation 19. This is Revelation 20. This is Daniel 7. Listen. Here's a little phrase that holds a world of meaning. The world has been promised to Jesus. Every mile of the road you take belongs to Jesus. The Kremlin, the White House, Beijing, London, it all belongs to Jesus. Every mountain range, every river, there's not a square inch 
of this earth over which he doesn't say, mine. That's biblical. That's historical. That stretches our mind to the edges of exhaustion. But it's true. The Father has promised the Son the nations. And there's going to come a blockbuster moment at the end of history when Jesus will come back and the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and Savior. Amen? That's going to be a moment when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that He is Lord. That's the final score. Wherever we are in the game and when the losses come and we get behind, that's the final score. Pipe down. Persevere. Be a faithful believer. Endure the loneliness. Be a minority. Be left out. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. This is Revelation 5, by the way. When you get to Revelation 5, you have the setting of the stage for the rest of the book of Revelation, which is about Jesus conquering the world and ending up in a thousand-year reign when man will beat their swords into plowshares, when righteousness will come like streams down the side of a hill. In fact, Samuel Chadwick, the great Methodist preacher and leader, read Revelation 5 every single Sunday morning for 40 years. Why would you do that? I mean, of all the, all the chapters in the Bible you could read across your lifetime, why would you read Revelation 5 every Sunday for 40 years? Because in the end, we win. In the end, Jesus takes the planet. Because in Revelation 5, there's a scroll and there's seven seals on it. And John looks at it and they're waiting to see who's going to be worthy to take the scroll. What's the scroll? Most prophetic commentators along with myself believe it's the title deed of the earth. It's the nations as the inheritance that's promised here in Psalm 2. Because if you read the background history, testaments and wills and inheritance had seven seals upon that literature. And no one was found worthy. And John begins to weep. Is the world destined to stay broken? Lying in the lap of the wicked one? And then he said, don't weep, John. The Lion of Judah, he's worthy to open it. And he looks behind him, and it's not a lion, it's a lamb. It is the Lion of Judah, but he's there as the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. The Lamb, as has been slain, which is a reminder that Jesus has come. And he has absorbed the wrath of God for his people and those who put their trust in him. He has broken the power of death. He has sent the message to the kingdom below. Your days are numbered. And now he's about to take the scroll and get ready for the second coming, which is Psalm 2, when the nations will be his. And he breaks the seal. And there follows judgments. Seven trumpets, seven seals, seven bowls. And it all culminates in the battle of Armageddon, it all culminates in Jesus coming from heaven with the armies of heaven and with a sharp sword out of his mouth, he tells them, drop dead. Everybody thinks there's going to be this big elongated battle. But you read, it's out of his mouth he speaks. And in Second Thessalonians, it talks about he speaks from his breath. And as White Pentecost said at Dallas Seminary, he'll just say, drop dead. End of story, game over, mismatch. That's where we're at. Asias Yes, Lewis Johnson says, Revelation is advanced history about how Jesus, by means of judgment, becomes king. Love that quote. That's worth memorizing. Revelation is advanced history about how Jesus, through means of judgment, becomes king. That's just where we're at. Where the Father invites the Son to take the nations and break them, those who rebel with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces. How fragile is a piece of pottery? You know? My wife's got some really dainty pottery in the house, some china, you know? If I'm handling it or, or holding it, two hands. Uh, I, I don't want to face the wrath of Queen June when her royal Dalton hits the kitchen floor. Okay? Pottery smashed. So it's an image. And again, it's back to that idea of they plot a vain thing. Their nuclear weapons, their armies, their arrogance, their pride. Are you crazy? They'll be dashed like a piece of pottery when Jesus comes. Let me tell you a quick story and wrap this up. It's to do with Queen Victoria. Forgive me for all the British illustrations today, but 
Some years ago, the British newspaper, The Daily News, carried a story written by Dean Farah, great English churchman, who had heard from a minister firsthand that he had actually preached to the Queen at Windsor Castle. And in the middle of his sermon, he talked about how Jesus was going to come as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and it grabbed the imagination of Queen Victoria. And at the end of the sermon, she said to that minister, I sure wish he comes during my lifetime. Taken by that, the minister said, well, why would you say that, your majesty? To which she replied, for I would love to lay my crown at his feet. And every king and queen will. And every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. The voice of the nations, conspiracy. The voice of the father, contempt. The voice of the son, conquest. Here's where we finish verses 10 through 12, the voice of the Spirit, conciliation. There's an amazing end to this psalm. There's been thunder and lightning. Wrath has been promised. And yet here's where we end. Now therefore be wise, O kings. What kings? The kings that could be smashed like pottery to the ground. The kings that rage against God. Is God not done with them? So great is his love and so deep is his mercy that there is a rod of iron coming, but there is an olive branch extended first. Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth, serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling, kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, when his wrath is kindled, but a little blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Before we get there, to the end time, to Armageddon, to the judgment, to destruction, to the lake of fire, to hell, damnation for the nations who forget God. Before we get there, God reminds them of the love he has exhibited in the sending of the Son, the first coming. For God so loved the world, a world that rages against him, a world that hates him and his Son. He sent a Son into the world that those that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to face the judgment of God. You can put your trust in His Son. Kiss the Son. There's a choice here. Kiss the Son or feel the heat of His wrath. Quite simple. I used to preach in the open air with an old brother back in Northern Ireland when I was a young Christian and a young preacher, John Foster. And one of his favorite lines to share with people that were passing by or in private conversation, Oh, my friend, there is a heaven to gain and there is a hell to shun. It's so true. That's the choice here. There's a heaven to gain, but there's a hell to shun. Kiss the sun lest he be angry. The book of Revelation talks about the wrath of of the Lamb. This is the Lamb who took away the sin of the world. This is the Lamb who absorbed our sin on the cross and suffered on our behalf. But if you go walking by that carelessly and thoughtlessly, you face His wrath apart from Him. Refuge from Him alone is found in Him. And so I'm going to urge you, if you don't know Christ, kiss the Son. Don't fight the Lord and His anointed Son. Kiss the Son. Surrender. You can imagine what that image is, right? It's the image of of an army that is bending the knee. It's the image of a king before a conquering king. And he pays homage and he kisses the feet or the hand of the conquering king. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry. Show homage. Surrender. Trust. Obey. But as we close, my friend, the hand you kiss in surrender... And the feet you kiss and surrender are hands and feet pierced for you, wounded for your transgressions. This is a loving king. This is a merciful king. Righteous will show his wrath, but he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. Christ stooped to save you. Will you not stoop to be saved? Can I say that again? Christ stooped to save you didn't sit pretty on the throne of heaven, became obedient even to death on a cross. He stooped for you. You won't stoop for him. You won't kiss the son lest he be angry with you. He kissed you first. He kissed this world in mercy and love. And he would have you kiss him back in surrender and salvation. As the team comes up,
Maybe a good story to finish with is a story with the English essayist Charles Lamb. He was among a group of literary men. They were discussing the heroes of history, some of their favorites, both in the literary world and the political world and life in general. And then they wondered if some of those men were to walk into the room, what they would say, what they would do. And the great English essayist Charles Lamb said, because he loved Shakespeare, he said this, if Shakespeare were to enter, we would rise to our feet in admiration for his accomplishments. But brothers, if Jesus Christ were to enter, we would fall down at his feet and worship him in adoration. So we should, so we will. It's not a question of will you. It's a question of when will you. Will you do it as a matter of salvation? No. Or will you be forced to do it before Christ banishes you from his kingdom as a rebel and a traitor? Father, we thank you for this solemn, sobering, sweeping psalm that takes us to the end of history. The nations that rebel, smashed, judged, banished from God's presence into outer darkness. Lord, we thank you. This is the final score. And it helps us in the first, second, third, or fourth quarter of life when things are going against us, when we're down a score as the church. We thank you for this reminder. In the end, we win because he wins as King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, help us to have a heart for those who are against the Lord and his anointed. Help us to realize we ourselves were once traitors and rebels. But we thank you for the day and the hour we bowed the knee and kissed the son, lest he be angry with us. So help us to be ambassadors, to go to the nations, to remind them that they belong to Jesus Christ and the future belongs to him and they need to belong to him for a good future. For we pray and we ask these things in his name. Amen. The future belongs to Christ. What a glorious promise from God's Word. You're listening to Know the Truth, the Bible teaching ministry of Philip DeCourcy. We're in the midst of a brand new series called Be Encouraged, and we hope you'll continue joining us every day of this study. One easy way to make sure you never miss a message is by downloading the free Know the Truth app. Or you can subscribe to Know the Truth on Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts. We're constantly looking for more ways to deliver Know the Truth to listeners like you. But while we never charge anyone to listen, these programs are not free to produce. And that's where you come in. When you donate to support this ministry, you cover the cost of production and distribution so more people can listen. And when you give today, we'd like to express our thanks with a copy of a biography of Charles and Susie Spurgeon titled, Yours Till Heaven. Charles Spurgeon is well known for his powerful preaching and writing, but this intimate biography gives a glimpse into his personal struggles with discouragement and how his loving wife Susie walked with him through it all. Their marriage provides a wonderful example for our relationships today and how we can remain joyful, faithful, and loving despite the challenges of life. This book would make a thoughtful gift for your spouse, or you might add it to your summer reading list to take on any upcoming vacations. And again, we'll send you a copy with our thanks for your support today. To give and request the book, Yours Till Heaven, call 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. If you prefer to write, our address is Know the Truth, Post Office Box 30250, Anaheim Hills, California, 92809. I'm your host, Wayne Shepherd for Philip DeCourcy, inviting you to join us again Friday when we'll be reminded that we have hope beyond the grave. Tune in Friday right here to Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Mm -hmm.